Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is William Cheng. Uh, I'm the uh, a professor and uh, the director of the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries. Uh, I will be uh, introducing uh, today's speaker. Without further ado, I'm very excited to be introducing our presenter today, Dr. Ian Perry. Ian is an emeritus scientist with fisheries and oceans calendar and an adjunct faculty member of the IOF. I know Ian through various previous collaborations with DFO, as well as through the conferences and meetings, particularly those organized by the North Pacific Marine Science Organizations, PISES, that Ian has been very active in. Ian is known to, be as a, 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 to me as a champion for ecosystem science in DFO and in the North Pacific region as well, and particularly trying to promote interdisciplinary research linking from oceanography to biology and the human dimension. This really resonated with the works uh, of the IOF. I think that's one of the reasons why many of us collaborate with Ian in different capacities. Besides that, he is such a good person to work with as well. Ian is actually an alumni of UBC. He holds a BSc from the Department of Zoology and a PhD from um, Zoology and Oceanography, both from UBC. His research expertise includes the structure and function of marine ecosystem, ecosystem-based management to marine management, and the human dimensions of marine ecosystem change. He is a former chair of the International Global Ocean Ecosystem Dynamics Go Back Program, and a former chair of the Science Board of the North Pacific Marine Science Organization, PISES. He is a recipient of DFO's assistance, deputy ministers' distinctions, and Project Excellence Award of um, ISIS, as well as the um, DFO's David uh, Devon Distinguished Career Award and the 19, uh, 2019 recipients of PISES Worcester Award. So welcome, Ian. Um, please go ahead. Well, thank you, William, for that very kind introduction. And um, thank you all for joining me on uh, what for, I, think, I think for many of you is still a, a holiday. So I, it's uh, great to, to I can't say to see your faces, that would be nice, but uh, at least to have you around this virtual table. And I too would like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Sunemuch uh, peoples, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful place to live. Um, I, I wanna start by uh, saying perhaps a little bit of word about my title. A and the, the key part of my title is in fact the comma because I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about DFO, and then I'm going to talk about the Sailor Sea. You'll, you'll see that they do bridge together. But when I was invited to speak, um, the invitation sort of suggested uh, that um, I, since I'm a, an adjunct member of your faculty, but also have worked for DFO for many years, that I might want to talk about experiences of being a, a government scientist within DFO. Well, I thought about that, and I thought that would, that would be interesting. And maybe for the students in an in-camera session, it might be more interesting. But for a general audience, I thought that I would bridge it in with uh, some work that we've been doing within DFO and elsewhere on the Salish Sea. And so, um, my uh, so I want to I want to invite you that this again is your holiday. So I want to invite you to sit back, relax. If you got a drink, even better. And let me tell you a couple uh, of some stories. Uh, and I'm going to start off by talking about DFO and the provision of science advice. And I also want to take us all the way back to Rosemary Omer's presentation at the, the start of this fall session in, um, in September. And Rosemary talked about scales. And in particular, she talked about hierarchical scales within academic science and within govern, government science. And she noted that a really important point that these are not, although they are often presented as um, stovepipes, they are in fact related because of course, all government scientists are trained by universities. And I might say to the students who are watching us this morning, that many of you will in fact come eventually to either work with or work for uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And so it's helpful for those of you who are Canadians to understand how this system is structured. And for those of you who are not Canadian, you will hear a lot about uh, DFO in the news it helps to have a little bit of context of what kind of an organization this is. And um, I've been in and out for many of the presentations this fall. They've been super, they're really good. I particularly enjoyed those presentations which start with a hypothesis, 
show how that they've built the experiment and then show what the consequences mean. Those are great for tracking through the science process. But my talk's not gonna be like that. My talk is gonna be a 10,000 meter view of DFO for one and then of the Salish Sea for another. The details are all on the slides and I'm certainly happy to answer questions afterwards. So with all of that, let me get started on our prologue uh, about DFO. Now, just this year, 2021, we have moved from six to seven regions nationally, and they are Newfoundland and Labrador, the Gulf region, uh, Gulf St. Lawrence area, the Maritimes, Quebec, Ontario and the Prairies. The Arctic is our newest region, just established from the last year or two, and then Pacific, which includes BC and the Yukon Territory. And as I was saying to, to William, when we were just kind of getting started and checking out the, the, the system worked here, you can't give a government talk without, without an organization chart. So this is the organization chart, but it's important to sort of let you know how we're structured. So at the very top, of course, is the minister who at the moment is Joyce Murray, uh, deputy minister under her. And then we split off into two, two sectors, two groups, I suppose. One is the Canadian Coast Guard, and the other is the um, what might be called fisheries and oceans. And there, there are seven now regional directors general and eight different sector uh, people rep representing, assistant ministers representing the different sectors. Only one of these is actually solely concerned with science. And that's in the brown dash line there, the assistant deputy minister for ecosystems and ocean sciences. So it's important to round the table to recognize that this is a science-based um, department. Science before, uh, forms the basis of all the advice, but there are many other voices and many other considerations which, need, which go into providing advice to the minister. On the uh, left-hand side, you'll see how Pacific region is organized. And there too, there is a, a science branch, but it's one of six or seven different other branches so again, even in the Pacific, science forms the basis for uh, the advice and the decisions that, that are made, but there are lots of other voices that go into the actual decisions that are, are being taken. And you'll see that in a couple of slides as well. Uh, within Pacific region, we have, uh, and science branch, we have one, two, three, four, five, six different divisions, uh, which are probably more that the working level that many of you with the, with certainly IOF and the students will come into contact with the people who are among these different groups. And then off to the far left is something called CSAP. And that's really where I want to get to. It's the Canadian Science Advisory Secretariat. And uh, we have the Pacific manifestation of that is the Canadian Science Advisory Secretariat Pacific, of course. This... Uh, um, organization or structure, it's within DFO, but it's a, it's a separate secretariat, as you can see, it was formed in 1997, and it coordinates the scientific peer review and the advice for DFO. Uh, it's the, it's, and it publishes the departmental advice and information on the many issues that you'll see there, including, of course, fish stock dynamics, species at risk, invasive species, uh, different ecology and ecosystems, this is a very formal process for um, building the science advice for DFO. And I, I have I've been part of this for many years, others have. And, and for those of you who have gone through a master's or a PhD defense, this isn't like that. This is much more intense than that. It's collegial, but um, there are different points to view that are being expressed and uh, very detailed analyses and discussions on the data. It's an interesting process to go through if you get a chance to do it. At the bottom there, in particular, are the products that uh, the CSAP and CSAS organization or secretariat produces. Science advisory reports, research documents, meeting proceedings, and then science responses. These are incredibly valuable uh, repositories and analyses of core data in many cases um, of, of how the science advice was obtained if you're doing a study anywhere in Canada, uh, particularly on fisheries or ecosystem, marine ecosystem issues, you need to be aware of this organization and aware of these kinds of reports. And you can search for them in the gold. If you search on the Canadian Science Advisory Secretary, you'll, it's quite well organized. You'll find all sorts of interesting stuff. 
So let me just give you one example here. So um, this is for the stock assessments. <clears throat> DFO uses a, a precautionary approach for uh, fisheries decision making. And basically it breaks down very simply into three zones. There's the critical zone, which is in the red, a cautious zone, which is in the yellow, and a healthy zone, which is in the green. The uh, circle number one represents the limit reference point. That's the limit below which the serious harm will be done to the stock if there are removals that are continuing. The point number two is the upper stock reference. This is the level below which um, fishing mortality needs to be ramped down in order to prevent serious harm to the population. And then the green zone is pretty much where you wanna be. Now on top of this, there is this dashed line, which is the uh, number three there. This is the removal re reference rate. So basically you want to try and keep everything below this dashed line within either the yellow or preferably the green um, zones here. <clears throat> so that's what DFO science does. That's what the CSAS process uh, develops is the understanding of for any particular species or stock where these different limits are. Then we hand it over to our management sector colleagues and their job is really difficult. Basically, they need to decide where and how the target removal rate should be set. So the target removal rate preferably is within this green zone below this dashed line. So given the science advice, where do we actually want to put the fisheries management regulations? And this depends on a number of considerations, one of which is social considerations. So let's say that you put the, that they want the, um, re, re, sorry, the removal rate to be as close to this dashed line as possible. But that doesn't tell you how the fish need to be caught. Because if you use uh, catch limits, if you use quotas, uh, catch limits, if you use size, sex, season regulations, each of those have very different, each of those will, if you like, preserve or catch the same amount of fish conceivably, but each of them have very different social and economic consequences. If you're doing catch limits, those are very different than doing size, sex, and season area considerations. So uh, DFO does not have a good process, certainly doesn't have a process as rigorous as the CSAS process for um, deciding on what these social considerations might be for and analyzing what these social considerations are for deciding where the target removal rate should be set. Another aspect of deciding on the target removal rate is the biological or perhaps ecological considerations. Um, we're in a world now where we recognize that fish don't occur on their own, they're within an, an ecosystem, how that ecosystem is structured, how it functions and how it uh, interrelates with fishing all have impacts on the survivability uh, and the health of the fish stock. And that's where I want to bridge into the main part of my presentation, which is the um, changing Canadian part of the Salish Sea. So when I talk about the Salish Sea, think of it as being in brackets, the Canadian Salish Sea. And for those of you, again, who are not from around here, perhaps, um, the Salish Sea might be a common name, but for those of us that were born and raised on this coast, there was a lot of confusion when this name was formally adopted. It was suggested by Bert Weber from Western Washington University in the 1980s. Uh, and it does not supplant the existing names for the Strait of Georgia, Was Strait of Juan de Fuca and Puget Sound. So it's basically similar to the Mediterranean Sea, which includes the Gulf de Lyon, the Adriatic Sea, you know, all the different kinds of bodies of water in the, um, in the Mediterranean. And here, the concept of the Salish Sea also includes to the drainage basin. So we often think of it as being from white, white tops to white caps. So the Salish Sea is warming. We have 100 years worth of data now on the temperature in the Salish Sea. The surface temperatures have been warming at a, just over a half a degree, 100 years. And they're warming through all depths. And you see there's lots of variability, but the trend is, uh, is a warming trend. At the same time, the Salish Sea is freshening. So it's getting less salty. Uh, and it's getting less salty by about a half of uh, uh, part per thousand in the old terminology per 100 years. 
Part of that is being driven by um, the body of water outside the Strait of Georgia that comes in, it's getting fresher. But a lot of it is also being driven by increasing freshwater discharge from the Fraser River. And here you can see that the freshwater discharge has also been increasing of about five cubic kilometers per hundred years. Now I can't talk about the Salish Sea and not mention at least some of the non-ecosystem changes that are taking place. And one of those, of course, is sea levels. And given the rising, rising sea levels, given the, the freshening um, saw, uh, water, marine waters, uh, it's not surprising that the sea level is also increasing. So the sea level at uh, Victoria, when, once you correct for land movement, has been increasing at about 12 and a half centimeters per 100 years. And you at UBC will be experiencing this many times if you drive along the Spanish banks, for example, during the, the high tide and the storms period in the wintertime, you see flooding onto the beaches there. And I'll let you, in your minds, uh, work out how many millimeters a year that 12 and a half centimeters represents. So in terms of the biology, um, some salmon populations are certainly declining, coho and Chinook key among them. First panel up here represents for coho, and you can see that uh, wild populations have generally, this is a um, smolt survival, wild populations have generally done better than the hatchery populations, but both of them or all of them have been increasing, are decreasing, particularly through the 80s and in the 90s, so they are generally very low levels now through the 2000s, a bit of a bump up in 2000. Uh, in terms of Chinook, again, Chinook uh, abundances have been declining. Some analyses will take the red line and say that that's declining at that kind of a rate. My preference, I think, when, if you're critical and look at the data, is to see perhaps an inflection point about the mid-1990s, where it's, although it's been variable, the Chinook population has been more or less the same abundance for the last uh, 20, um, 25 years or so. And of course, Southern resident killer whales populations are declining. Estimate that uh, since 1960, the highest number was 96, lowest number was 66, but it's really the trends that are important here. So we had an increasing trend from about 1975 through to uh, 1995, and then kind of a decline, oops, declining trend through to, um, to 2020 when we have 74 animals that have been census. But things aren't all bad. Other cetacean populations have been increasing. So in particular, uh, this was a cetacean census that was run by DFO in July of 2018. It was done coastwide, but I've pulled out the data for the Strait of Georgia from their analysis, which is here. And in particular, some humpback whales have been increasing throughout the North Pacific, but also in the Strait of Georgia. And in 2018, summertime, there were estimated to be about 300 humpbacks, over 500 dolls porpoise, and almost 4,000 um, harbor porpoise. Now these don't necessarily stay in the Strait of Georgia all year round, they come and go, but the fact that they're here at all, and the fact that they're at high trophic levels means that the ecosystem, there must be something good about the ecosystem that is attracting them to this region. Pacific herring abundance in the Strait of George is relatively high, particularly when you look at other herring populations coastwide. The solid black line is the median estimate with the uncertainty around it. Red line is its limit reference point, and then the bottom uh, histograms show the catch. So in 2020, not the highest perhaps, but it's certainly among the highest, which was in the period 1990 to 2000 or so. Many of you will be familiar that coastal or transient um, uh, big killer whales abundance is high. These data are for the population coastwide. You can see they've been increasing almost exponentially since 1975. And although these data were done in 2007, they've continued to increase. Now, many of you who are familiar with this will know that these are called mammal eaters <clears throat> or mammal hunters. Here's what they um, are, have been uh, determined to feed upon. And you'll see that over 50% of their prey are harbor seals. And this is one of my favorite pictures that uh, Jared Towers from DFO took this where uh, those seals know what, where they need to be when the uh, transient killer whales are around. With the, the seals themselves, harbor seals, we have seen an exponential increase in harbor seals from the mid 1960s, basically when we stopped killing them. 
Um, but the interesting point here is the inflection uh, since 1995, and that the harbor seal population with some variability has more or less remained constant. And as you can see with the couple of slides that I led into this one, we think there are, our, our understanding is that they've remained const, constant more or less because they're in an, they've come into an equilibrium with their predators being the transient killer whales. And we did some work uh, recently with uh, Ben Halpern's group um, on the Ocean Health Index for, in this case, for British Columbia. The Ocean Health Index is comprised of several um, of data which represent several goals. And you can see I've listed them along the right-hand side there. The key points from this slide though, are that the highest value, so the, the, each of those petals represent the scores for one of those um, goals. And then this, the value in the center represents the aggregate or the, um, uh, the aggregate score for those goals. And you can see that the highest goals, the highest scores rather, are in uh, Northern British Columbia. But the Strait of Georgia doesn't do too badly. It's 82 there, BC in general is 83. Uh, if you're not familiar with this kind of analysis, they've done it for globally for countries around the world. Scores generally run from the high 50s, 60s up to the high 80s or so. For British Columbia, and by extension, Strait of Georgia, not too bad on uh, the one assessment of the uh, kind of human coupled human and uh, natural uh, environment of um, uh, marine environment. So the key point from this first part is that the Canadian Salish Sea, uh, yes, it's different now than it was 30 to 50 years ago. However, the changes are, are more nuanced than all is bad. Some stocks and populations are doing poorly, but others are doing quite well. So let's move on to act two of our little story and uh, what might be driving these changes. And you can see by the pictures that I've chosen to highlight this slide that I'm gonna be focusing on two main topics here. One is mother nature and the other of course is us. Um, you can do an analysis of the, so it, this, this slide shows that the fish productivity of the Strait of Georgia is somewhat higher than other similar bounded seas elsewhere. Uh, it's calculated by this equation over here. So this is based on the fish catch. It's based on the primary productivity and some estimate of the mean trophic level of the catch. Um, and you can see that the Strait of Georgia, in this case, Strait of Georgia, the perimeter, the connectivity with the open ocean of the Strait of Georgia is about 2%. So it sort of lines up with the Baltic and the Mediterranean Black Sea. But in terms of its um, uh, ecosystem efficiency, it's a little bit higher, more in line with some of these other areas which have much greater openness to the surrounding seas. And I think that's uh, the position of the Strait of Georgia is in part because in fact, although it's got a 2% um, of its perimeter connected to the outer ocean, in fact, there are several populations of important fish species which migrate between the Strait of Georgia and Southwest Vancouver Island, herring being one, a number of stocks of salmon uh, being another one. So in fact, I think the Strait of Georgia productivity here is getting a little bit of a boost by those stocks which are uh, spending their summers off the west coast of Vancouver Island and then moving back into the Strait of Georgia and elsewhere to spawn. Sophie Johannesson at DFO has done a nice analysis of the uh, marine productivity um, for the Strait of Georgia over the last 140 years using sediment cores from several different um, locations within the Strait. She's concluded that basically there's, although there's been variability, there's been no trend in the um, amount of primary productivity or the accumulation of organic matter um, derived from the marine environment. However, the accumulation of organic matter from the terrestrial environment has increased significantly. And you see this is um, backwards in a sense, so that now is here zero and 140 years ago is on the right. And you can see that the contribution of land-derived organic matter is much higher now than it was 140 years ago. You think of all the land clearing and such that's been going on since then. Whereas with the um, primary marine productivity, it's relatively, um, there's no trend, but there's variability. So I wanna show you um, some slides from the lower trophic levels and give a sense of what um, is kind of driving or related to their productivity. So weekly phytoplankton biomass, uh, it tends to be uh, related to both remote and local physical forcing. This is a study by Karen Sushi. 
Um, and for example, the histograms here are the central strata of Georgia weekly chlorophyll anomalies. And she found that the northern strata of Georgia chlorophyll A was related to atmospheric indices, such as Pacific decadal oscillation, North Pacific gyre oscillation, and so on. But that for the central strata of Georgia, chlorophyll A was related more to local factors, which tend to be indirectly influenced by climate, such in particular as flow from the Fraser River. And you think of where the Fraser River comes, its greatest impact is in the central part of the Strait of Georgia. In terms of zooplankton, our group has done um, quite a bit of work on uh, zooplankton in the Strait of Georgia. I'm showing now some data for a central and northern part of the deep Strait of Georgia. And it was related to, found to be related to three uh, physical processes, sea surface salinity at Entrance Island, uh, the peak of the spring phytoplankton bloom, and the larger scale um, process of the Pacific decadal oscillation. And you can see here the trends in zooplankton biomass, a minimum around 2005, and then a recovery so that by 2010 and 11, it's perhaps not as high as it was in the 90s, but certainly better than it was 20 years ago. And you can see here that this tends to be inversely related to the salinity anomalies at, the, um, at Entrance Island. So when salinity is high, or put it the other way, when the zooplankton is low, salinities tend to be higher. And these um, both physical and zooplankton data can be used in an analysis of the early marine survival rates of at least some stocks, we didn't do them all, but some stocks of Chinook salmon in the Strait of Georgia. And it turns out that with Cowichan Chinook, for example, here, uh, a model which includes sea surface salinity, sea surface temperature, and total zooplankton biomass was able to explain 85% of the variability of the early marine survival of Cowichan Chinook over this time period. And with Puntlich Chinook further up on the uh, east coast of Vancouver Island, the model was, had surface salinity and medium-sized copepod biomass which explained 38% of the early marine survival of Puntledge Chinook. So the point I'm making is that uh, lower trophic levels, perhaps not surprisingly, tend to be related to physical factors, mother nature, but these can then cascade up to influence uh, the species that we are all very interested in. But as my initial slide showed you, uh, people have a lot to do with this area as well. And the Salish Sea can't be understood properly unless it's in the context of a coupled marine social ecological system. And elsewhere, I've argued that this is arguably, this is Canada's most human dominated marine system. There are about 400 people per square kilometer of surface area, and it's increasing with 2% over the last uh, 40 years. This is a map showing the population density from the latest um, Salish, State of the Salish Sea report from Western Washington University you can see how it's all, uh, how people are distributed. But, and again, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, the, Im the importance of the Salish Sea to these communities, to the people around the Strait of Georgia is not the same everywhere. And in particular, uh, when you look at the employment statistics for fishing and fish processing, those activities are more important for smaller communities than big cities. Not a surprise, but it helps to, um, uh, showed, have data to back this up. And in many cases, it's forgotten when um, people are looking at the processes of the uh, Salish Sea. So you can see here that for areas like Comox, Powell River, Sunshine Coast, um, much more important fishing than it is for Vancouver and Victoria. Um, there's some nice work done by Natalie Ban, who's now at the University of Victoria, but was a student at the former fisheries um, center at UBC who participated in a BC um, marine conservation analysis mapping of cumulative human pressures on the BC coast. And they uh, modeled the distribution of uh, 38 human pressures on benthic, shallow pelagic and deep pelagic habitats from all of these different kinds of activities and then combined them up into uh, an impact score here. But what I wanna show you is to zero in on that boxed area for the Strait of Georgia and show you here on how these uh, 38 human pressures mapped out over the Strait of Georgia uh, impact each two by two square kilometer planning unit. So the cumulative area is this part here on the left-hand axis and the histograms are the area of the Strait of Georgia with multiple pressures on the right-hand axis. 
And you can see that the most common number of pressures in any two by two kilometer planning unit was up here, some around 20 to 25. And there are very few planning units which have over 30 stressors. But 20 to 25 human pressures on each four square kilometer area of the Strait of Georgia is still important. And of course, one of those pressures is um, fish, commercial fisheries landings. Here's the trend of commercial fisheries landings over that last uh, past hundred years for the Strait of Georgia. You can see demersals in the blue and um, pelagics in the mauve or the purple, high through the 40s and 50s, uh, 60s, strong decline in pelagics in the late 60s, more gradual decline of demersals in the late um, uh, in the 60s very low now through 1994, the demersals. Instead, we've seen a significant increase in the removals of invertebrates through the 80s, and they tend to have leveled off as well. Now you need to, if you've been careful and looking at this when I've been speaking, you'll note that um, demersals, which are in the blue here, are and invertebrates are on the right-hand axis, and the pelagics are on the left-hand axis. And you'll see that the pelagics are scaled 10 times that of the demersals and the invertebrates. So in fact, these pelagics in the same scale would be way up here somewhere. But the point that I wanna make is that uh, at the moment, the commercial removals uh, landings are quite low, rel certainly relative to their um, historical landings. So how does one combine these um, natural pressures and human pressures on the, um, to understand how the Strait of Georgia marine ecosystem works. We did that statistically. We gathered uh, as many um, full time series over the range 1970 to 2010 as we could. They included both natural and human drivers and, uh, and pressures, states and impacts. I won't go through these, but you can see what they are. We used, um, so the drivers and pressures were the explanatory variables. States and impacts were the um, uh, response variables. And we used redundancy analysis to, um, to sort of sift through all of these. And it turned out that the um, explanatory variables that were significantly uh, were significant in explaining all the variability or the variability in all of these state and impact variables turned out to be six. And very, very conveniently, there were three um, natural variables and three human variables. So they were um, sea surface temperature, wind speed at, at Vancouver Airport, the large scale pressure of the North Pacific gyre oscillation, human population, recreational fishing effort, and then the number of Chinook salmon released from hatcheries. Both human population and recreational fishing effort are almost monotonic increases, increasing over this time period. The others are, are much more variable. And uh, you can see how this um, shakes out when you plot them against the the redundancy axes here. You can see that for um, several years, from 71 to 84, the um, Strait of Georgia marine ecosystem kind of bubbled around uh, uh, here. And then between 84 and 85, there was a switch. Old terminology, we might have called this a regime shift. And then for several years, it kind of bubbled around in here. And then in the mid 1990s, there was a switch again, not back, but a switch to a new state where the time series bubbled around over in here. So this maps out, if you like, the kinding, the, the changing ecosystem on an aggregate level for the Strait of Georgia. And it turns out that if you look at just the three physical variables alone, they describe um, a, a similar pattern. The details are obviously different, but they're kind of a different pattern. The, the grouping of years are somewhat similar where there's a group of years that all are of similar and then a switch to another group of years. So you can do pretty well with understanding the variability, uh, the variability of the Strait of Georgia through um, physical variables alone. The human variables contribute largely to the trend. So that leads me to the question of how the Strait of Georgia marine ecosystem works. Um, Andy Backen, who was a fisheries oceanographer um, 25 years or so ago, proposed a theory called, which has become known as the uh, Backen's triad hypothesis for what makes for a good reproductive ha habitat for coastal pelagic fisheries. And he, he had three, enrichment, concentration, and retention. 
And so for the Strait of Georgia, we started with those and found that they were insufficient, that we needed three more. So there are basically, we've um, proposed that there are six general processes for understanding how the Strait of Georgia functions. One of them is enrichment. And enrichment need, means, as you might guess, the um, uh, increase of the addition of nutrients, the enrichment of nutrients to the system. The second one is initiation. And in this case, it means of phytoplankton blooms. So think of this as the start of the productive cycle in the springtime and, it, and its timing and the changes in timing as on land will make a difference to the, uh, how the marine ecosystem responds. The third one of these is retention. All of this stuff in the Strait of Georgia needs to be retained somehow and not just uh, as a coastal upwelling system lost out to the open ocean. So by being a bounded sea, uh, the Strait of Georgia by its configuration tends to retain much of the productivity. Concentration refers to uh, within the Strait of Georgia, how the nutrients, the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, the fish are concentrated, the seals, the whales, are concentrated in, into particular hotspots, uh, which make the, um, the background, make, make them much more, uh, material much more highly concentrated than just an average background concentration. Uh, and then there's two others. One is the trophic or food web dynamics, the efficiency with which that material is transferred up the ecosystem. And then the last one is the near shore or benthic or basically like, like habitat dynamics. The, 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 um, perimeter of the Strait of Georgia, because the Strait of Georgia is relatively small and contained, what happens in the perimeter habitat, what happens on the benthic habitat, have important implications for what happens in the marine ecosystem of the Strait of Georgia in general. Um, and three of those, the bottom three there, concentration, trophic food webs, and nearshore dynamic, dynamics, uh, are potentially directly impacted by human activities. We can't do much about enrichment, we can't do much about the timing of the spring boom, the retention is pretty much fixed, fixed by the geography, but we can have impact on these last three. And so the key point for this section is that the Salish Sea must be considered as a coupled marine social ecological system. The different scales of impact and change are important. Key long-term drivers of change are increasing human population uh, and climate change um, and their interaction. The cable variability is gonna be driven more by environmental processes acting both at large and, lo and local scales. And the, um, there's a difference between large and small or urban and um, uh, rural type communities. And so for the last section, a few slides on what can we do. So the important point to recognize and remember is that the Salish Sea is going to continue experiencing changes. No matter what we do, and in, in many cases, in, uh, just, uh, because of what we do, um, the Salish Sea will change. But the key point here is many of these changes are gonna be unexpected. And such, I'll call them surprises, are likely to be due to the interactions and the nonlinear effects among climate change and increasing human population and all of the things that come because of the increasing human population. So what we need therefore is to understand these interactions and to re rebuild, and I'll say rebuild, the natural resilience of the Salish Sea ecosystem to enable it to adjust to and withstand surprises. Now, here's a bit of a catch. Uh, there are good ecological reasons for thinking that a high natural resilience of the Strait of Georgia will occur with the predominance of species such as jellyfish. But a resilient Salish Sea filled with jellyfish is not gonna go over well. It will be seen as a failure by human society. This is a picture from Japan it's, it's a real picture. It's a, actually a huge um, uh, Neopolema um, jellyfish, which have been aggregated by fishing gear in this case, but it, it serves to illustrate the point. So the, the key points then are not only to rebuild the natural resilience of the Salish Sea in general, but management must also consider impacts to and the resilience of ecological keystone and charismatic species such as Pacific herring, Pacific salmon, orcas, and other large whales. And so the, the challenge I think needs to be reformulated into uh, understanding how to rebuild the natural resilience of the Salish Sea to known and unknown future changes, while at the same time supporting the resilience of keystone and charismatic species to these changes. So how do we do that? So in black bold is just what I, I uh, had in blue on the previous slide. So there's some potential solutions. One is 
at least at its present intensity, I'm arguing that major quote unquote solutions do not reside with reducing fishing. So I'm not advocating for increasing fishing, however. So I'm talking about in general, major changes to the Strait of Georgia marine ecosystem is not likely to happen if we, if we reduce commercial fishing more. The important exceptions though, include possible local situations. There's always, always local situations of the Boundary Bay area for crabs, for example, or other areas um, that might be important for herring. Uh, recreational fishing, I think needs to be looked at more. Um, Pacific herring, I've already mentioned as a keystone species and of course Chinook uh, salmon is prey for Southern resident killer whales. I'd argue, however, based on the slide I showed you previously about the six um, processes that drive or structure the Strait of Georgia ecosystem, we might be better off thinking about um, uh, ensuring areas of concentration, being a plankton, fish feeding, spawning, remain pristine, quote unquote, or at least as pristine as possible. Um, that we do what we need to do to maintain the natural functioning of the trophic web. Uh, web and that we maintain the natural functioning of nearshore and benthic dynamics. And so the key points overall, um, reviewing the kind of three acts for this play, uh, the Salish Sea is different now, but it's not all bad. Need to consider the Salish Sea as a coupled marine social ecological system. At present, I'm arguing that commercial fishing is not a major driver of changes in the ecosystem, but recreational fishing needs to have more look uh, at it. And the challenge is, as I've stated, to understand how to rebuild the natural res resilience, um, but at the same time, supporting the resilience of particular key elements of that, um, of that system. Now, every good play has got uh, an epilogue. And so uh, I have just a couple of slides as an epilogue. One of those, of course, is a thank you. This, um, the material that this is, uh, presentation is drawn on is uh, is based on, has been drawn from the work of many, many people, both inside DFO and outside. And uh, I'm not going to read them all out there, and you can have a look at them uh, if you want later. Um, but I, where I wanted to end up and perhaps leave you with this as we move into the questions is some, some uh, points for further information and resources if you'd like to dwell into this in more detail. And, and one that I would highlight is the uh, panel discussion that's coming up on the 30th of November. Um, moderated by uh, Catherine Marlowe, CBC Radio, and featuring Dr. Christopher Harley and Dr. Debbie Ianson. Uh, Chris is with UBC, Debbie's with DFO, um, obviously talking about the Salish Sea in a warming world. And you'll see that I haven't, I haven't really gone into the future. I'm going to leave that to them. The others, uh, ranging from more recent to um, um, several years ago, are what I kind of turn to frequently as go-to sources for information on the state of the Salish Sea and different processes. So uh, with that, I'll leave that up and, and turn it back to you, William, or Colette, or whoever will kind of moderate uh, the questions, if, if, if there are any. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ian, for a super interesting talk. Um, and yes, we have plenty of time for questions, which is really great. Um, I'm happy to kick things off um, if no one else has one. Um, at Colette, just sorry, uh, I, my for some reason I don't have the volume, or the volume isn't up very loud. So uh, you're coming, everybody's coming through a bit faint. So you may have to sh to show. Maybe it's my hearing. I'm not sure. <laughs> no problem. Is that better? That's better. Thank you. Okay, I, I can just move my microphone closer to 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 my sure. mouth. That might help. Um, so I was saying, thank you very much for a really interesting talk, and that. Um, Whilst uh, others are warming up to ask questions, I'm happy to go ahead and ask you one. Um, so I was just um, in the zooplankton slide that you showed, um, it also pertains to the phytoplankton one, but it struck me particularly perhaps for the zooplankton one, you showed abundance, um, which I think is a really interesting dimension to measure. I was just wondering in terms of abundance, whether you also measure um, composition and whether similar trends you, I mean, so basically whether the composition of the zooplankton community has remained the same or whether it has changed. Because in context with ecosystems, to me, the composition of the animals within a group are also going to be important. So I was just curious as to whether you have any questions from that perspective. Yeah, yeah no, excellent question and very uh, astute to notice that. Um, again, in my 10,000 meter view, I didn't go into the detail of any particular study. Uh, in the study that we published, which was um, earlier this year, we go in, we break it down by um, zooplankton composition, species composition. Uh, and in that case, we've grouped it up into sort of major taxonomic groups. Um, 
uh, so that you can read the paper to see that. But the, the quick answer is yes, there have been significant changes in um, species composition. Often what one finds is that while the total biomass may remain fairly constant, the species composition is changing like crazy underneath all that. And the different, as you note, the different species, different taxa have significant implications on who's eating what and how, how much energy they can provide to the upper trophic levels. So um, we've seen an increase in um, gelatinous plankton. So, so basically it breaks down into that U-shaped pattern is largely driven by crustaceans. So some of the large copepods, some of the euphosids, some of the amphipods. There tends to be a, a, a not a monotonic, but a more, a more increasing trend with some of the gelatinous zooplankton. Hence my comment and slide on the, the uh, gelatinous plankton being perhaps uh, ecologically one of the more resilient groups of taxa. Um, and so basically that would be my answer is that the crustaceans have shown kind of a U-shape and the gelatinous plankton have shown an increase there. There are uh, other species which have declined. Some of the big copepods have uh, declined and been replaced by other large copepods. So there is quite a bit of change in underneath that figure that I showed you. Thank you, Ian. Um, and I see that Tony Farrell has his hand up. So we'll turn to him next. Tony, go ahead, Tony. Hi. Hi, Ian. That was absolutely terrific. It, it gives me uh, great confidence in the science that uh, DFO uh, scientists do perform. It, it really was a, a, a beautiful uh, balanced talk. Thank you. Um, Thank you. My, my question comes back to the triad that you mentioned at the end and, and the enrichment uh, aspect. And it also links to your human uh, population. So in, in my uh, 39,000 foot view of uh, human population, we take rainwater, which would take stuff from the land, but we add a bunch of stuff to it. I could use a four letter word, which then is processed by water treatment plants, but it still goes in. So the net effect is that rainwater is now diverted through humans, which then acts as a significant enrichment. Has anybody considered that dynamic uh, in, in the changes that have been going on? Yeah, and um, as we will have noticed, rain is kind of uh, topical at the moment, isn't it? Um, so the studies that have been done, and admittedly they were done 10, sometimes 20 years ago, have looked at the amount of nutrients contributed by the Fraser River, largely from agricultural runoff, versus the amount of nutrients that are input through the uh, natural exchange through the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Yeah. And uh, overwhelmingly, the amount of nutrients, well, put it the other way, um, the amount of nutrients contributed by the Fraser River are small relative to that contributed by the uh, natural flow processes of flushing in and out of the uh, Strait of Georgia Salish Sea from the west coast of Vancouver Island. I think to the extent where 80 to 90 percent of the nutrient source uh, into the Salish Sea is from the, nat from the west coast of Vancouver Island. So in that case, um, uh, it, it's why I said enrichment wasn't a human do, uh, do, um, driven process. It tends to be dominated by the natural process of flushing in and out. Now, having said that, you bring up an interesting point about rainwater uh, and the uh, kind of stuff that's accumulated in rainwater and flushed into the Salish Sea. To my knowledge, um, in, for the Canadian part, I don't, I don't know of any, and I, don't, I admit to not knowing everything about it, uh, if anyone has looked at the contributions by rainwater. Down in Puget Sound, particularly in the Seattle area, there's been quite a bit of work done looking at the heavy metals and other contaminants from road runoff and such in rainwater flushed into Puget Sound. And I, I know that can be significant, but Puget Sound is really quite a different system than the Strait of Georgia. Thanks very much, Ian. So if, if we went to 15 million in the lower mainland, which is the, the projection for our water uh, resources, I mean, that's drinking water, do you think that would change? We're at, we're at about 2 million now. Oh, so well, well, it will have an effect. Um, I, I think the natural source will still sort of be the dominant source, okay. but you know, you're talking now about incre decreasing from 80 to 70, yeah. maybe 60. I would hope that by the time we get to 15 million, we found a way to treat that waste water and recycle it <laughs> rather than flush it back into the sailor sea. Me too. Thanks very much, Ian. Great.
Thank you for that question. Um, William, I see your hand up. Go ahead, please. Thanks. Uh, thanks again, Ian, for the uh, for the great uh, thesis of the incredible amount of uh, of uh, scientific work that the have done in understanding the the Silishi ecosystem. Um, I uh, I think I mean it's it's it's, uh, it's really amazing to see that um, development of the understanding ecosystem understanding from the oceanography to the human effects uh, uh, in the area. Uh, in, in your experience, how how does that just body of uh, scientific works and knowledge uh, have informed um, the developments of the FO policy in addressing uh, and managing the um, uh, disability sea? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, basically, you're asking how, how is how is DFO developing developing an ecosystem approach to marine management? Uh, and it's, it's a work in progress. So I think at the first step, uh, one needs to understand how the system works, at least in some sense. We need to understand where the pressure points are, what is driving uh, changes in the system, because those are really where we get more bang for our buck, if you like. Um, DFO is, uh, has a, an eco, a national ecosystem approach working group. Um, they've taken a number of species across the country and are working through how those species can be assessed in a very formal way uh, including ecosystem considerations. Pacific herring tends to be one, I think on the Pacific coast, I, I think it's more for the North coast than the Strait of Georgia. Shrimp is I think another one for the East coast for Newfoundland, for example. Um, so we're at the progress, the process of working our way through. Um, and what I've presented to you has been more of the foundational work, the fundamental science to try and understand uh, what's driving those changes. Now, you can see, by the way, I presented this, that not all of the pressures on the Strait of Georgia or the Salish Sea are within DFO's control. So really the, the, the common sense, when I was working more uh, with the Globet group on ecosystems, we used to say, well, if we wanted an ecosystem approach, we wouldn't start here. We would completely reorganize how our marine systems are managed to include transport, to include all the other things which tend to be Put into different stovepipes. So DFO can go so far, but we need to do more, um, I think, in the long run to bring a true ecosystem uh, approach to marine management. Thank you. Thank you, William, and thank you, Ian. Um, we have another question which I'm going to read out, um, which is how the CSAS a scientific advice from DFO is used by other Canadian government branches to make decisions? Right, another good question, thank you. Um, so the, the Canadian Science Advisory Secretariat is a DFO or um, secretariat. Uh, it, its origin is rather interesting. It was, it was actually originated out of the um, Atlantic Cod collapse when uh, there were concerns that science advice produced by DFO, because DFO has produced science advice for many years, uh, wasn't um, being made available and wasn't being, um, it, it, maybe lost its punch when it went into the political uh, mixing um, grinder of things. Uh, so while this is a DFO process and it's very formal and rigid, um, it works by client groups asking questions. Basically client groups ask for advice from DFO or from CSAS. And so other uh, government departments could do the same thing. They would ask advice for large projects. So the Roberts Bank Superport uh, expansion, for example, um, uh, uh, including Environment Canada, Transport Canada, and others would ask advice. It would have to be some aspect of that would have to relate to DFO's mandate in some way um, for it to be accepted by CSAS, but uh, we can provide advice to other sectors or other departments through that process. Thank you. Um, and maybe um, I see that Rashid has his hand up as well. And so maybe quickly we'll squeeze Rashid's question in as well before closing things off. Well, I'll try to make my answer short. <laughs> yeah, Ian, <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Ian, you see, I'm not putting on my, my video because the lighting is not good. So, so yeah, thank you for doing this. My, my question is, you know, uh, you're a DFO scientist and I've always admired how you you did a lot of science, not only nationally, but you also had a lot of international connections. And uh, how did you do that? Because I know many government scientists who, who tell you, we cannot do this, you know, how, how did you manage to do that? 
Yeah, another another great question. I've been asked by that that by other colleagues in DFO uh, who are starting their careers. I'm kind of wrapping mine up. Um, I was very lucky, I think, for one. Um, I also uh, have problems saying no, and so I accepted almost every opportunity I can I could to do something. Uh, sometimes they went nowhere. Sometimes they were horrible experiences, but other times they led to other opportunities, which kind of built in and on itself. Uh, also, I think having um, a, a kind of, a, I'm a generalist, I'm, a, I'm a, a lumper, not a splitter, I tend to be, and being able to look broadly and to being able to synthesize um, information from a number of different sources really helps when you move up through the, through the, um, the scientific hierarchy. Rashid, you're, you're a super example of that, as are M M Brian and many of the others, most all of the others, sorry, uh, in, in the fishery center. So that's the way it worked for me. I, I was lucky. And DFO allowed you to do all that, right? Well, actually, um, I, some of you were, will remember a few years ago under a different government, the DFO scientists were not allowed to speak to the media, except for me. I was designated as the <laughs> spokesperson. And so there were times for weeks on end, this is when the, the blob was big, um, where I was doing nothing but talking to the media. So yes, DFO science allowed me to do that. Uh, DFO <laughs> with science is more forgiving and open than, than you might think looking at it uh, ex from the, from the outside. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Th thanks very much for that insights. Uh, I think that's a uh, very good uh, advice also for, for many of us as, as well as uh, particularly for the uh, for the younger scholars as well. Um, so I would like to thank Ian again for uh, on behalf of the LF for your time and the incredible talk that you've given to us. Uh, I've learned a lot from it, uh, certainly, and uh, it also stimulates uh, a lot of ideas and thoughts uh, to explore further. I'm sure uh, my other colleagues uh, share that thought as well. So thanks very much.